group and we should have ample time for um, for questions and answers and discussion. So the chat is open if you want to ask some questions like as the presentation goes on, you can ask in the chat and then and then afterwards um, when we sort of get through the speakers, we can we can just kind of like open it up and you know unmute ourselves and and um, and talk then. Um, so, so so thank you and I guess without further ado, I'll I'll, um, I'll hand it I'll yield the floor to to Emily. Thank you so much, Gavin. And um, I'm really excited to be back here and so encouraged that you are keeping this committee together because um, it's just so important um, that people have a space to come together and talk about, um, you know, obviously it's not just dyslexia um, that um, students and families you know, have challenges with navigating the system um, around. So um, it's just so important that people have a space to come together and, and share. Um, I am just going to put a caveat forward that um, I know in these types of, of spaces that people are at different levels of knowing and not knowing. Um, so this is really like a primer, um, but I'm happy to like sort of go through it quickly and sort of you know, dig deeper if people want. Um, but really also just know that no question is to, um, to beginner. Um, you know, this is all a journey for all of us. So, um, so yes, um, my name is Emily Hellstrom. Um, I, uh, have a son who has dyslexia and sort of in trying to help him and my family navigate through the system, I realized that the system was really broken. Um, and I joined up with some other parents along the way. Um, and we realized that, um, while we got our students, um, and our children where they needed to go, um, that it was, um, filled with, just so many challenges that um, even I, who have a certain number of privileges and access and abilities to navigate systems and speak English and all sorts of different reasons why I could could do that, um, it was extremely difficult for me. So um, we knew that we needed to change that. But along the way, um, we became sort of experts in in this field because um, it was sort of just that insatiable desire to understand what was going on um, with our kids. So I'm just going to make sure. Whoops. Um, so just first, just wanted to start off and say that um, at Literacy Academy Collective and certainly NYCPS, we come to this um, from a civil rights perspective. We believe that that every child should learn to read, um, and that um, that really this is um, fundamentally important. Um, and for many people um, who are navigating the system and trying to, um, if they don't, the consequences can be really severe. Um, so while it can feel like you're struggling with your own child, like I never had to worry about, you know, what was this going to mean? But many, many, many families um, are struggling with the fact that um, the effects, the after effects of not getting what they need and specifically for not reading um, can lead to um, acting out. And then um, if you... Uh, you know, have a student who is um, black or brown, particularly boys, they tend to be labeled as um, lots of other things and suspensions, expulsions, um, and ultimately interaction with juvenile um, and criminal justice, um, I mean, criminal system. So this is like really important stuff that we're grappling with here. So I just want to like center that um, and make sure that we all know what we're talking about. Um, what is dyslexia? Um, just want to like center also the fact that this is a real thing, in spite what many teachers and and educators and people may say to you along the road. Dyslexia is real. Um, it is actually a neurobiological um, um, difference in the brain, so, and that that has been actually documented in physical images. So um, don't let anyone tell you <laughs> that it's not real. It's real. Um, and I bring a picture of the brain um, front and foremost, because actually um, with the advancement in imaging, um, they have actually mapped out and charted that there are certain areas in the brain um, that look different um, in with kids who have dyslexia. I think what's interesting is that um, students who fall two and three and four years behind in their literacy skills 
even if they didn't start out having documented dyslexia without um, the ability to learn that that neuroplasticity starts to set in and the brain start to look the same. So even though, you know, we have, you know, our literacy rates are really um, in a tough place, um, the brain structures, we know about 10, 5 to 15% of our population has um, dyslexia, but um, without remediation of all kids learning to read, um, some of these brain functions can really um, get uh, very hardened. So lots of common myths about dyslexia. Um, and and just want to point out uh, um, some of the things that often come up. Oh, is it just reversal of letters? Isn't that just when they flip things around? And um, it's, it's so much more than that. Um, sure, you know, prolonged flipping of letters um, can be a sign. Um, it's just, it's not the only thing. Um, and I, I go further, a little bit further down the, the list. A lot of times when people say, oh, it's flipping of letters, they say, oh, it's a vision problem and vision therapy. That is not dyslexia. Um, and a lot of times um, because vision therapy is covered under a lot of um, health plans, doctors steer towards that because it's it's covered and that um, might help a vision problem, an actual vis vision problem, but it will not help dyslexia. So I just um, caution people that if they're getting feedback of like, oh, go to this doctor and do eye exercises, um, you know, unless you actually have a documented vision problem, it's just not going to help dyslexia. Um, it also is not isolated to English. Um, English is a very, very complex and complicated language. Um, for those of you who know Spanish, you know that um, the letters in Spanish all have only one sound associated with them. Um, it's a much less complex um, language that way. There still is dyslexia. So um, this is across languages um, all over the world. So just in case, uh, so you can be a, a multilingual learner and also have dyslexia. But a lot of times people are treating saying, oh, you know, let's um, do a lot of spoken language. That will not help um, your multilingual learner who is struggling with um, the, the, um, you know, phonetics and graphemes, phonemes and graphemes that need to be coordinated. So um, just want to point that out as well. Um, some common signs um, in case you're sort of trying to say, does my kid, do, do we need to like bump this up? Um, low self-esteem, anxiety, um, irritability and sadness, acting out. I underline that because so, so often kids who are struggling to read, um, especially kids who are really aware that they're struggling to read and embarrassed and shameful about it, tend to, um, you know, they, they, it's like they're they're pointing at it to the grownups in the room in the only way that they know how. And that might mean um, going to the bathroom seven times during reading class or um, disrupting the big joke teller, um, you know, all of those things of disrupting and getting out of, I mean, Mayor Adams, um, who has dyslexia, um, talks about literally going through years of school and praying every day that he would not get called on, just absolutely sitting intense anxiety over, please let me not be seen. So like all of those social emotional aspects um, to literacy go along with it. So um, just because you're seeing these things doesn't necessarily mean you see, need to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a therapist. It could mean that you just really need intense um, good reading instruction. And a lot of those emotional aspects can sort of start to fall away. Um, reduced motivation is another one that I just want to point out. Um, I had a family um, who was in one of our programs who said, oh, my son, I know it's just awful. He's just so lazy. I, I just can't take it. And you know, it really broke my heart. And I, I had to stop her and say, hey, listen, before you use the word lazy, I just want to say, when you can't read, um, it can be really demotivating to when all of the suggestions that grownups have gone through um, 
aren't working, you might not want to do it anymore. And she said, gosh, I never really thought about it that way. And um, in fact, you know, he's not lazy in any other thing, like in any other area of his life. And so, you know, that might be, you know, another way to be thinking about, you know, when we put these labels on kiddos that, um, you know, a lot of times there are a lot of underlying um, causes for, for some of these things. Um, anyway, I will give this to Gavin and he can hand this out. Um, and so you can sort of look, um, but there's also a lot of um, like understood.org goes through, um, in different age groups, very specifically, um, signs to look for at different times in, in, um, and these are all part of it. So, um, I'll give him that. Um, so I don't want to dwell on the negative. There is some good news. And I love this kiddo's smile. 95% um, of kids um, have the cognitive ability to learn to read at grade level. Um, so I just want to like really like land on this and put that brunt and center. 95% is a huge number <laughs> um, when we consider all the range of, of um, you know, of kids who are out there, um, this is really what we should be aiming for and what we can achieve. Um, science tells us that. Um, so how do we get there? Like, how do we do this? Um, you know, you might have heard science of reading. Um, we are living in a time right now that is really encouraging. We are all signs are um, pointing towards the fact that our city and our state is gra are, are, are definitely recognizing that we have not been doing this well and that we need to change. Um, so you might hear some of these terms, structured literacy, explicit instruction, multi-sensory multi phonics, systematic cumulative instruction, OG, um, Hockman writing or the writing revolution. So these are all part of what we know of um, as science of reading. And science of reading just means these are evidence-based practices that have been, um, you know, gone through the rigors of our scientific process to show that they have results for kids. And that is all kids, um, not just uh, dyslexic kids, not just struggling readers, really all kids. Um, and of course, that is why that we should use these. Um, but but I want to point to actually the, um, this culturally responsive and sustaining education, these three pillars. This is another reason why we should use this, because um, we know that in order um, for CSE, CRSE to be in place, um, the very first pillar is that students must experience academic success. And that is all students. So just because you have dyslexia does not mean you can't experience academic success. And our uh, literacy structures have to go um, and make sure that all kids are, are not just being told, oh, you're doing a good job. They must experience it, right? They must feel it themselves. Um, so to me, these are some really important things for parents to understand. Um, just because a lot of blame gets placed on families and parents about literacy. Um, so I just want to point out um, the first one, everyone learns to read the same way. I just want to like put it out there. Think about that for a moment. Do you think this is true or false? And I would just say the answer is true. Um, and I don't necessarily mean that you all have to use the same curriculum, but we know that the neuropassageways of all kids everywhere around the world, the neuropassageways for literacy are the same. Doesn't matter if you're wealthy, not wealthy, no matter what race. So um, reading does not develop naturally. Um, that's another common one. Um, and that is something that we've gotten really stuck on um, is that like, oh, if you just put a kid in in a book full of room, uh, I mean, a room full of books that they'll just learn to read. That is just not true. Um, it's a much uh, later evolved um, part of the brain. So um, that is not a natural thing. Um, there is, in fact, a known pathway for um, reading. Scientists have discovered that. Um, and sort of contrary to the uh, everyone learns to read the same, there are not actually multiple ways um, that kids learn to read. Um, it's just not true. Um, again, 
being in a print rich environment or just acquiring background knowledge alone, while those two things are really important, I don't want to discount them, for at least 60 um, to 70% of the population, just being in a print-rich environment or just having background knowledge will not alone teach you to read. Um, so just really important to note that. Um, again, we're born to walk and talk. We are not born to read. Um, so if you leave a child um, alone or sort of are around them and just sort of talking around them, nobody needs to give explicit instruction on talking. That's actually a much earlier evolved brain function, um, talking. Um, so really just being around kids and talking will have them talking really pretty much no matter what, unless there's a very serious um, underlying condition. Um, everyone learns to read. Same goes for walking. You don't need to actually like explicitly teach kids to walk unless um, there's a severe underlying condition. Um, that is not true for reading. The majority of people need to be explicitly taught to read. Um, and same with this, everyone learns to read differently. That's not true. Um, read alouds and exposures to books can help, but they alone will not make a skilled reader. That is true. Um, and then Really just want to emphasize that this approach is good for all readers. All readers learn better from explicit, a systematic approach. Um, they Some kids might go faster, but it doesn't even mean that they don't need it. Um, so it, at least 65% of children must be explicitly taught. And the good news is the other 35% benefit too. Um, so just want to take a moment. This is um, sort of a goofy little graphic, um, but it's one that I really love because it's totally accessible and it sort of gives you an idea of where, what we're talking about here. So um, here up in this top in this green um, section, um, about five to 10 percent of the population really, for whatever reason, they're almost like hyperlexic. They, no matter what, will just learn to read. And Part of the problem is a lot of teachers and educators fall in this um, band. So for them, they don't ever really remember learning to read. It just was effortless for them. Like a lot of people, you know, if, if that happened to you, chances are you had a really good interaction with school and you might go on to be a teacher. Um, so you might not really understand the rest of this ladder. Same with the green part with broad based instruction. Um, pretty much you'll do okay. Um, but then we get into this orange band and I just want to pay, you know, really close attention about 40 to 45% of the population in order to read, spell and write proficiently, they require a code-based systematic explicit instruction. Now that is a huge percent of our population um, that needs this. And then there's an additional 10%, 10 to 15%, who not only do they, do they need that, but they need it with many repetitions. So again, that's where you get into that sort of 65% who must have this explicit, systematic, code-based instruction um, in order to learn to read. Um, I just want to also land on this because some people get really confused um, they're like, oh, but isn't, you know, content and comprehension, isn't the real reason that we're reading is for comprehension. And that is true. We do. We want to comprehend what we're reading. Um, so this is like the simple view of reading and it seems simple. It's based in science. Nobody's saying that learning to read is simple. All this is saying is, is that decoding is part of the, the equation. Comprehension is the other part, but they're multiplicative. So decoding times comprehension equals reading. That means that if you are not decoding and that number is zero, you are not reading. So it doesn't take away comprehension. It just means that if you haven't gotten the decoding, you're not going to be reading. Same with the comprehension. If you're not, if you're decoding really well, but you're not comprehending, you're also not reading, but both have to be there. Um, and lastly, this is a, just a deeply um, important part of um, what it means to be um, a fluent reader. 
all of these strands must be taught. Um, a lot of times people talk about vocabulary and verbal reasoning and literacy knowledge and all the stuff we do, you know, a somewhat good job at the top part of this reading rope. What we have almost completely ignored um, up till now is um, phonological awareness, decoding, sight recognition. Without this, you cannot become a good reader. And in fact, they're learning a lot more about background knowledge um, and vocabulary and all of these other things also in different ways. They must be explicitly taught. Um, a lot of times we talk about, oh, main idea. They've shown that main idea actually does not go a long way to teaching, um, <laughs> talking about the main idea doesn't go a long way to teaching what the main idea is. Instead, background knowledge, understanding of the topic, much, much better at teaching um, um, the comprehension piece. So we're learning so much about this through science. Um, and then this is just to show that if you're not doing this, um, it, it's that Matthew effect where if you're not doing it by about third grade, you really stay flatlined. Whereas other kids, as they start to decode, it's like the rich get richer. Um, as you start to decode, you read more, you understand more, you get more background knowledge. Um, so good readers start to really acquire this and it goes fast. So we got to catch this early um, and, and really start to do, you know, pour it on thick. So some of the things that you should be looking for in your classroom, um, especially early readers, uh, K1, 2, um, even into third grade, these are bad practices. These are practices that not only will not work, but they will actively teach um, strategies that will go against teaching your kid how to be a good decoder and ultimately a good reader. Um, this one in particular, this is what was in this uh, lip the fi lips the fish, eagle eye, stretchy snake. Um, this was in practice for a long time in district two. So um, definitely important to look out of this. If you see this in your classroom, you should be talking to your teacher. This um, is teaching things, um, practices that will encourage guessing, encourage skipping words. Your kids should not be skipping any words. They also should not be looking up off the page at word walls that are up because everything they need to know should be on the page in front of them. Um, they should not be looking away from words. They should be being taught explicit um, techniques for recognizing phonemes and graphemes um, and mapping those together um, and, and sounding out words. So just want to point that out. Um, these are not good practices. They are uh, known as balanced literacy and they do active harm, especially especially for kids who are struggling readers um, and, and dyslexic readers. Um, so point it out. Um, lots of schools will be like, oh, my, you know, we have phonics, you know, we're sprinkling it in. Um, especially if your kids are in early elementary years, there's nothing sprinkled about it. It should be intensive um, and it should be tracked by assessments to say, are you moving systematically through this sequence and can move on? It's teach to mastery. Once you master the, the um, segment, then you can move on um, and go to the next and then be putting it all together. Your kids um, should be starting off in decodable readers. If they're flipping through that and decoding and you've got like one of those green bands, great. They should be moving on for sure. Um, but if you're part of the orange, light yellow, red, you should be absolutely systematically going through and learning how to decode. Um, so I just want to sort of, and if this is too much in depth, Gavin, I can sort of stop there and um, take some questions um, for some more in depth. I just saw what time it was. So, yeah, I think that I think that might make sense at this point. Um, yep. We have questions. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. I have one question. Is this is the sort of balanced literacy the same as like whole language? I've heard that term before. That's another um term for it. Yes, whole language. 
And I can confirm Grace looked at those, looked at that slide, Emily. I'd never seen that before. And half that stuff was in her classroom, second, first, second, and third grade. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure not, you know, on purpose or anything. It just, that I know. was the standard, you know? Yeah. I mean, and that's the other thing that was sort of one of my last slides is that um, I just, I just want to emphasize, this is just not about shame and blame. Um teachers we were finding all the way up into like graduate level courses like this was not taught and 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 the really that for a while the jury was really out it was only in sort of the early 90s that we were getting this imaging back of the brain to really understand you know was whole language working or was this other way working and so um it was really unknown for a little while and then there were some practices that sort of took hold. There's lots of different reasons why. Um, and again, some of it had to do with like not knowing. Um, and it became sort of like, oh, this is what we think works. And um, now we know. We now we know better. Yeah. And so I think the idea is to not like sort of stay in the past, but really front and center, understand certainly as parents, what am I looking for? What am I asking for? And and how do we um, use the structures that exist in these really incredible public schools with incredible teachers who are very, very knowledgeable? How do we harness that and make sure that your kids not only are getting what they want, but for enough time um, in the day so that it can make a difference? Yeah. So if we're... You know, again, that, that I recognize all those signs. As anyone who's been in elementary school has, has seen those things in in the, the third grade classroom. So, what is the right sort of stuff? You said everything should be on the page, but obviously, people put stuff on the walls. Like, how do you then make uh, an environment that supports all readers? So, I mean, I, hi Kelly, it's so good to see you. And um, you know, I know I'm sure you have lots to add in this as well. Um, so one of the things that we're pretty excited about, and I know that people are a little nervous, um, I imagine, about like mandated curriculum, because um, that can feel a little mandated. <laughs> um, the thing I think that the school system is trying to say is we don't need, it, it, it's like going into a grocery store and having like 57 choices of cereal. Like we know we need to get rid of the Fruit Loops and probably there are like 20 good cereals, but really like Wheaties, Grape, Grape Nuts and, uh, you know, Cheerios, that's probably good enough, you know, because all those three are going to give you what you need. And and so I guess all that is to say it doesn't mean um, only do that, but starting with a good um, solid foundational skills program and um, solid curriculum that is rooted in these evidence-based practices is a really good start for tier one, because what we know is um, right now we've got a, not necessarily in district two per se, but in a lot of schools, we have up to, upside down triangles where we have sort of 80% of our readers um, are not reading and only 20% are when really it should be, you know, 20% need some extra help, 80% are doing fine. Um, so for sure, that is um, a good start. Uh, I would just emphasize that these curriculum um, are good for readers who are good too. So like, or, or who get things more easily as well. So it's not to say that, um, you know, this stuff is good for everyone. So I, I think the three mandated curriculum, you know, I, I know Kelly, I don't know if you've chosen already, or I know this is phase two coming up. Um, but hopefully principals are excited about that. I would then say there are some, if your child is still struggling with that and needs more help, I would say elevate that quickly um, and then get into a really solid foundational skills program. Again, looking at numbers of hours during the week that you're doing that and then really tying that to um assessment like the the Acadians progress monitoring where which I know is like a fancy term but 
that is where you're going to start to say, hey, listen, is this child making enough progress on these skills that they're going to start to put together cracking the code? And then are there, is there enough background material? Like you want to, the, the big balance is to make sure that your child is continuing to get background knowledge and stay up with um, um, grade level content. And that's where things like videos and um, audiobooks and things and reading it aloud at home and all the good, yummy, juicy stuff that we want um, can be in conjunction with saying we need some intensive skills based curriculum in here. And it needs to be five days a week, you know, five hours a day, you know, I mean, sorry, an hour a day, five days a week. So we just need to find the time and and working with um AIS coordinators, um, principals, teachers, getting that team together um, to make sure whether you have an IEP or not to say, hey, listen, is this the right dosage? Does that make sense? I, I hope that's not too like highfalutin. I want to um, maybe you, um, yeah, I think we can, we can circle back to some of this. And I know that in district two, we're using like wit and wisdom as, as a curriculum. And we could talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but I wanted to give, I wanted to give Grace and, and Kate a chance to talk about, about their experiences and kind of like personally, like what, um, what are the, some of the things that you've encountered um, in your, in your school life, in your sort of school career that have been that have been particularly helpful and what is sort of the process what does the journey look like to kind of identify um like the need for some of this kind of instruction and and just if you can maybe share some of that i, I think that would be really helpful sure i'm going to share first and grace can jump in anytime and then she's going to talk a little bit and uh would love to answer any questions that anybody has as well um, so Grace was a uh, thriving, social, smart, second, uh, sorry, kindergartner and first grader um, at a lovely, uh, you know, high performing elementary school in the city and um, had amazing teachers each year. Had, I had an amazing relationship with the administration. I was on the executive board. And um, it was just, it was crazy. All of a sudden um, in second grade, she, in the beginning of the year, just started not wanting to go to school and slowly but surely, you know, her self-esteem and her, her confidence, like Emily had alluded to in the slide, just, it was almost like overnight, she became like a different kid, especially on school days and a lot of, you know, tears at night, a lot of anxiety attacks, which were not normal for her, and just outright saying, I don't want to go to school, I'm not going to school, I hate school, where, um, you know, she had tons of friends, tons of teachers that loved her, and there was no reason why she should be feeling that way. Um, <clears throat> and I, I was very involved in the school, I knew it enough that to just be like, where is this coming from? Um, so at the same time, um, her first grade teacher had warned us the year before, hey, she might have some phonics issues. If it's still around in second grade, um, I might recommend her to just get tested with the school counselor. But it was not kind of like raising the alarm bell at all. And so I thought, well, does that have something to do with it? Um, so I talked to the teachers about it and she did get um, assessed by the school neuropsychologist who was a veteran neuropsychologist and had been in the system forever, been at the school forever, was very well known. And she saw Grace and she um, <clears throat> assessed her and called us into the office and said, she's got some phonics issues, but it's nothing that we can't handle. We're going to, we're going to give her an IEP and we're going to put her in sets once or twice a week. Um, maybe she'll have to do an ICT class in the future. Who knows? But we're not worried about her. She's fine. So we did that until um, <clears throat> kind of the end of the first half of second grade. And Grace was just getting worse and worse. It was it was becoming very untenable. Um, and her first grade teacher saw me in the hallway one day and pulled me inside and said, you have to get her tested. And I said, 
I have gotten her tested. <laughs> and she's like, no, you need to get her tested. And what she meant by that, I know now, was getting an independent neuropsych evaluation. Um, <clears throat> so then I started really kind of getting educated about what could be going on. Um, and originally I had found the neuropsych because we knew there were some learning issues. We didn't know what they were. But really, it was because of her self-esteem and her confidence. I was really worried about her. Um, and he took one look. We were lucky enough to get in. I basically cried on the phone with the receptionist and begged her for an appointment uh, within the next few weeks. And she felt bad enough for me that she put me on the she put me on the list. And he took one look at Grace, came out of the room and said, she has a classic case of dyslexia. Her comprehension's fine. She needs to be decoded immediately. Your only job will be to preserve her self-esteem. She will She will work hard and she will be fine. And it was, he spent 10 minutes with her and exactly everything he told me was true. Um, so it took him that short amount of time to tell me what was going on where I've been working within the system of an excellent elementary school and no one had used the word dyslexia. No one had said, this is exactly what she needs. It was treated as like almost something you don't talk about. In fact, it took me two years to get the word dyslexia put into her IEP. Um, and long story short, we found a private tutor that worked with her twice a week for an hour and a half at a time. Um, and we're lucky enough that we could afford to do that. Um, it also happened during the pandemic, so it was all remote. And um, she's at reading level now. She's in sixth grade at a new school. She did amazing in fourth and fifth and sixth grade. Her grades are good. And um, But like Emily said, reading's always going to be difficult for her. Writing's always going to be difficult just because her brain works differently. But she knows that now. And... Um, you know, I think we'll always be looking for what support is out there. But I would say, and then I can turn it over to Grace for a little bit, but um, in terms of what worked well and what we, what I think we could do to help in the system, I think the good news is from my perspective and where I would like to help and where Grace would like to help is making dyslexia in particular something that can be spoken of in a school and something that kids can start <laughs> understanding um, that some of their classmates may have it and what it means and how it makes them different, but that it's, it's an acceptable kind of biological thing. And I think sometimes it gets lumped in right or wrong with some other kind of emotional um issues and disabilities that kids may have, and you may have both, especially in the ICT environments. But for kids like Grace, where she just has dyslexia, um, it kind of means that gets swept under the rug. And it was something that we both felt like we couldn't say out loud in her amazing elementary school. And that um, you know, I could talk about it one-on-one -on -one with her teachers, but it wasn't something that I felt like was acknowledged. And that's kind of easy to change. By fifth grade, what I did um, at this elementary school was start a committee for parents of neurodiverse learners. And so it really, it turned out to just be like a support group um, <clears throat> that met um, uh, you know, once every six weeks. And it was just a place where we could swap resources and kind of be a village square for parents that were struggling or had questions about their kids and just needed someone to listen and, and some support. Um, and I would like to continue to do that and encourage, especially elementary schools, to kind of foster that type of openness in their PTAs because, you um, it made people feel so much better just to be able to to talk about it out loud and to to hear that you know your struggles with the IEP process and things like that were weren't your own that other people had experienced it. 
So Grace, do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like first when you were like in second grade and you kind of knew something was up? Um, yeah, so like my mom said about my school not really ever telling me I was dyslexic or saying anything like, you have dyslexia or this is what's up, it's okay, whatever. I was kind of just like, I got really frustrated and overwhelmed when people would talk about their books and we would like talk about in the class like, this is what we're reading, why don't we share our thoughts on it? Because I couldn't understand it at all. I didn't know what I, I couldn't understand what I was reading. I was having a really hard time with it and it got really overwhelming because I would be reading a book and then I'd be like, I don't know what's happening in it. And that it was really overwhelming because I didn't know. I knew I was different, but I didn't know why I was different. And I knew I was dyslexic, but I didn't know what that was. I didn't know why I was different and I didn't know like what what how everybody else could read but I couldn't and it got really frustrating and overwhelming and then once you started working with your tutor and started kind of getting better at reading and learning and kind of doing all the repetition how did that change the way you felt because then we came back from the pandemic and you went back into third grade and you were all of a sudden back in school with your friends how did that you know, having been kind of decoded a little bit and getting better at your skill level, like, how did that help you? Um, how did that make school different? It made school different in the sense that I understood dyslexia more and I understood more of, like, okay, remember, like, it's fine, but, like, whatever. But, like, <laughs> I can read and... I know how to do this. It's just going to take me a little bit longer because I definitely understood it more and I wasn't getting as much anxiety or being more overwhelmed. I was, it was more of an understanding. And I remembered that like, I went through this to help me get decoded and that like, it's not going to be the same as when I was first starting. Okay. What are some things you think, um, because a lot of the people that can, that are on the line now can help affect other kids like you. So what are what are some of the things that you can think of that may have helped you like in third and fourth and fifth grade when you were just kind of adjusting to things? Um, can you think of anything that would have maybe helped you? Um, I think what didn't help me at the time <laughs> was that People were, like, all I was hearing from other people was just teachers and people in my school just telling me, it's fine, you're just a little, you're just a bit of a different reader, it's going to be okay, I know you're smart, you're going to get through this, it's fine. But I, what I felt like I needed to hear and that would have made me feel way better was, you have this thing called dyslexia, what's different about your reading from other people's reading was this and this and this. And I feel like I would have been like, when I was reading back then, I would have read something and not understood and be like, it's because of this, it's fine. I'll reread it and then go through it again and then see if I can still read it. And then, but at the time I wasn't understanding that. I wasn't understanding anything about dyslexia and I couldn't tell what was different from me. Do you think, because one of the things Grace and I have talked about is the possibility of her and other students like her um, visiting um, or talking with um, kids that have been diagnosed with dyslexia or that are kind of in the same boat and kind of just starting or in the middle of their journey? What, what, what would, do you think if someone had come in and maybe talk to like you and the counselor and a bunch of other kids that were kind of in the same boat. Do you think that would have made a difference? And what kind of stuff would you have wanted to hear from them? I think it would have made a big difference because um, I would be getting told from someone who is who has experienced the same thing and has overcome it and has gone through it. And then getting to hear how they got through it, how they also think it's frustrating, but you know, they're fine now, they're fine now, and 
like just getting to hear how it was for them so then I don't feel alone. Does anybody have any questions for either Grace or I? Um, so, Grace, you talked a little bit about sort of what you think would be beneficial to support um, students who are going through the process of of learning about their dyslexia and, and getting the supports they need. Um, it, I'm not putting it all on you. It's not your, your job. But do you think that there would be um, w things that can be done to support and educate all students? Like, are there things to sort of bring into the classroom? Um, it, did you get messages about you know, that people learn in different ways or things like that? Or does that messaging need to be reinforced and have teachers and school communities have that information? Like, what do you think could have helped your 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 classmates as well understand that, like, everybody that you're stressing about reading, they might be stressing about something else? Right. Like, do you think, I know we talk a lot about, like, openness, Grace. Like, do you think if some of your teachers hadn't just used the word dyslexia, but had kind of as you guys started doing more and more academic stuff, like in second and third grade, where it really wasn't just, you know, getting to know each other stuff. Do you think it would have helped to kind of level set every now and then with like, Susie may learn this way. Jeffrey may learn this way. There's no right or wrong way, but we have to be sensitive to, you know, how everybody's brain works differently, et cetera. Something like that. Would that have helped at all? Um, yeah, like having other classmates understand would have helped a lot because like if I ever get an opportunity to talk to some kid going through dyslexia, how I went through it, I wouldn't just want them to know. I would also want other kids who learn like differently that what it is so then like they don't judge other readers and other learners based off of how it's different I would just want to tell them like this is all different but you do it this way you do it this way there's not a correct way and there's not a normal way or a wrong way that's interesting so you're saying not only just talking to kids that you know may or may not be diagnosed with dyslexia but just like in general just like a yeah what what sometimes it's called like a peer-to-peer -peer type program like someone that is like you that's actually been there recently that knows what they're going through so that it's not just another adult saying you'll be fine don't worry yeah that it's like someone that looks and acts like them you know that can speak their language and maybe ask questions and things yeah just to everybody not just the people that are struggling interesting Can I just say thank you for sharing such personal stories about this? It really is helpful to sort of just ground this for everyone and, and super special that you're willing to share it. Um, I also have a question, um, not necessarily for you, but if there's anybody on here, I'm seeing in the chat that some are having challenges um, getting dyslexia listed on their IEPs. And does anybody have any, uh, that's shocking to me, it's such a clear, specific thing that can also be so helpful. Does anybody have any information on that or as to why it would be challenging or what can be done to be helpful? Maybe it, not. <laughs> it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be anymore. I think that we are, uh, NYCPS is definitely, NYCPS being the, you know, New York City Public Schools has done a ton of work over the past sort of year and a half to really educate a ton of teachers and school leaders and superintendents and um, really just up and down the system. So I think what, what can be a struggle is that school psychologists do not feel as though they can officially diagnose dyslexia. And so that's where like the trick is. Um, so I like, I remember when I was going through this with my son, you know, and he had had what's called the, um, the um, psychosocial, which is like what the school psychologist can give. And I remember thinking, great, now they're going to like know some stuff, you know, 
And really what you find out is it's not that they don't know some stuff. It's just that they don't know enough stuff to be able to make sort of an official diagnosis. So that can be frustrating. Sort of the g- good part about that is it, it, it's almost like the medicine is the same, right? So like if you have dyslexia, I find that those words can be very empowering and very empowering, especially to kids, because they can feel like, oh, my God, you mean like this is a thing? Like I'm not sitting here in my brain, a lot of the things that Grace was talking about, very isolating, very alone. By the same token, having systematic, cumulative um you know, instruct explicit instruction in these phonics based principles, plus all the other parts of the reading rope will go a long, long way towards remediating some of the issues that come up when they're reading. And then I would say also the same for writing. And it's something that we don't talk about as much, but dysgraphia can be cripplingly embarrassing um, because your handwriting can look different. Your product does not look like everyone else's. I mean, kids are not dumb, right? They're like, wait, you're telling me mine's good. I I see what my neighbor is doing. It's awful. Like I'm not, stop lying to me. And so so it gets into this like weird thing where grownups are lying and saying, this is good work. Don't worry. And kids are like, oh my gosh, this must be really bad if this grownup is lying to me and telling me this is good. So and 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 so it gets into this really tricky stuff. So if we have this systematic cumulative way where kids can measure, oh, I am getting better at this. I am experiencing academic success. Then some of the social and emotional burdens that kids are are carrying around with them saying, oh, okay, yeah, it might make, take me longer, but I see progress. So that's when the social emotional piece comes in and starts to get better. So having dyslexia on your on your diagnosis is super important. You should fight for it. You should ask for it. Even if you slip it in in other ways, like I know I got it on my my child's IEP by putting it in the parent notes. Um, I have a history, like that's the other thing to look for. Are there reading challenges in other areas of your family? This is highly, highly, highly genetic. Um, you know, my husband struggles to read, my dad struggles to read. So, um, you know, really educating yourself about some of the signs. Again, understood.org is a great resource um, to look for, you know, things to look for. Um, And so asking for those are very important. Even more important, though, is to educate yourself on what your child needs and then how much. Two days a week, half an hour. If your child is a year, two years behind in their foundational reading skills, you need to be asking for more. And there is a time element to this. Like, I don't want to like scare anybody, but it shouldn't be like, well, let's just wait or like no waiting. Um, And then the other thing I would say is um, you need to be informed as a parent of show me in the progress monitoring where they're making progress because that it's that like that Matthew effect that, you know, where you can be making progress, but if it's not enough progress to then catch onto that curve where you're starting to like read and comprehend and, and the orthographic mapping is really happening where like, we know this, right. Every word for, for, for fluent readers is a sight word you're not decoding anymore, right? So that has to start to become a natural process. If that's not happening fast enough, then all of that brain power is going on decoding and then the comprehension slips. So parents need to be, you know, talking to their teacher and seeing that progress and being shown, this is what we're, you know, these are the places where we're doing this and then the doses is enough. Grace, I just want to give you a shout out for um, speaking so clearly and eloquently and um, just fantastic about how it is that you have uh, worked on this and your transition from elementary to school to middle school. So um, thanks so much for for saying all that right now. Um, You know, your mom talked a little bit about how your skills have really grown. And so I'm curious um, as to how... um, 
you think that this is still impacting you um, and what it is that you might do about it uh, when you're in sixth grade uh, and in middle school? Like, how does it show up? Um, my guess is that you're uh, a much stronger reader now, but what are ways in which like this shows up and how do you how do you address it? Grace, do you feel like um, it's something that you that has come up actually using the word dyslexia and letting some of your new friends at your new school know about it? Do, are people more openly talking about it there? You feel like you can advocate for yourself any more than you kind of maybe maybe weren't able to when you were younger? Um, a big change that I've noticed is that people talk about it in a way more because I feel that now at my middle school, more kids know what dyslexia is. And at my elementary school, I felt like, oh, they don't know what that is. It's not worth telling them. But then like my new friends at my middle school, it's not something that I feel like I need to be like, by the way, I'm dyslexic. It's more something that like will just come up randomly and then I'll be like, oh, by the way, I'm dyslexic anyways. And then... <laughs> <laughs> and then like it just becomes more of a regularly talked thing I feel like in middle school and um something that I feel like has changed a lot is how you describe it because I read so in my time at public school I've we've read two books about a dyslexic character and one was in elementary school and the way that the teacher described it because a kid raised their hand and was like I don't know what that is can you explain it and she said she wrote out on the whiteboard the letter A, a lowercase, and then wrote it again, and it was flipped. And then she was like, they read it like that. And then I knew I was dyslexic, and I was like, that's not how I read. I read completely different. But then now at my middle school, my teacher described it in a way better way of like, it's just a different way of how you read. It's not like all dyslexic do this and all normal readers do this. It's more of like, sometimes dyslexics do this, sometimes dyslexics do this, but like, it's different from how most people do it, but she described it in a way better way that I feel like I can relate to a lot more. There's this cool organization, by the way, called Eye to Eye, like E-Y-E to E-Y-E. I don't know if you know that organization, but um, it's like a student to student organization that teaches other kids about um, dyslexia, learning disabilities, and uh, a student of mine, a former student of mine who's graduated college now he just um he's been really involved with it so if you want to check out a student organization that is um supportive but also serves to educate other kids it's it's a great organization that's great kelly we'll definitely look into that because it's something that i as a as a parent am willing to get involved in and do um even for schools that she didn't attend and that i know are out there just because i know how invaluable it was for me to be able to talk to other parents and then kind of the words would spread and people would come to me and you know there's nothing more rewarding than kind of like it's a simple it's a simple fix just, just find another parent that you can talk to and you'll feel so much better you know um and we are very open about it and the same you know for grace with peer-to-peer -peer stuff will definitely is there a presence of that or any kind of program that is something that is active now in kind of elementary schools of the district, or is it something where we would be like pioneering something? No, no, not pioneering at all. Um, the when my student was in it, you know, I was a principal of a middle school, and so I think he was um, a seventh grader. But what he did was that he joined it when he was in seventh grade, and then he got connected to like the broader New York City eye to eye organization, and then eye to eye there was like. 20 college age students or high school age kids that were a part of eye to eye and they came in and they did workshops for all of our middle schoolers one year and it was um it was really great so it's really all about like trying to empower uh and support kids like kids supporting kids oh that's awesome yeah great. i'll reach out to you for his name that's great hi i'd like to um just talk about how important it is the children's self-esteem and that when they're really young, as, as Grace had said, they know there's something wrong. So it's really important to try to find other activities that your child is very good at so that they can feel good about themselves in other ways. And to what I had done with my daughter, she's in 10th grade now, but we knew she had dyslexia in kindergarten. And 
of course, the teachers just pushed us off and pushed us off until second grade, we pulled her out. Um, but in the very beginning, I explained to her and told her, you have dyslexia and tried to explain to her how she's a little, she's going to learn differently than other students. But just like sports, you're good in soccer. Someone's not good in soccer. You're not good in reading. Someone else is good in reading. So it's everybody's different and everybody has their strong points and low and, you know, areas that they need help with. But it that is, to me, that was like one of the most important things is just highlight what else she is good at and that everybody has highs and lows. And to put a name to it, it was really good that we told her early on, you have dyslexia. So like when third grade, she wasn't in public school and her teach her, her friends were asking her, where are you? Why aren't you in school? She, I was shocked, but she's like, I have dyslexia. I learn it a little differently. And she explained it to them with like no concern, which I thought was, it amazed me. But don't be afraid to put a label on it for them so that they can explain it. I'm going to just echo that and say that I actually did the opposite because um, I just didn't know. And we did a lot of euphemisms around just, you know, some struggles with reading. And we didn't really embrace that term for a long time. And again, like kids are really savvy on this stuff. And there was this sense of like, grownups are hiding things from me. Um, and so you know, a lot of times I think adults get really afraid to label their kid and because it will put them in a box or that I don't know, you know, all of the reasons that with very good intentions, we try not to pathologize. Um, and, and in some ways it can really be damaging, um, to kids and they actually like grace, my son, you know, um, has a group of friends who are dyslexic and they joke and, you know, they have like their own way of saying, oh, my dyslexic brain or whatever. And, and yeah, it can, it can really help them um, navigate this so well. So it's important. I was just, I was just sort of thinking about my own experience as an IEP parent and thinking about the, you know, the way that that, that teachers sometimes sometimes present something and, and it's yeah often in that language of like oh well you know there's these challenges and you work through it and it's very like euphemistic and then and then getting going through the process of getting like a neuropsych evaluation and then you read like what the reports that that you know that the the teachers provide to the the psychologist and they're totally different than what they've been telling even all their progress reports. It's like suddenly like, like they, they can be, they're honest and they feel like they can't like be euphemistic with a psychologist. And, and that was like really like eye opening for me. And, and I kind of really wish that like at an earlier stage, like it could have put a name to something could have been like more like, like honest and open about that. But there really does seem to be like a, sort of reluctance to, to do that among some teachers. So that's where I think also, you know, like a parent sounding board could really help because I didn't know what questions to ask. I didn't know when someone said something might be up phonics wise, that should have, I know now, been like major alarm bells. And when she kind of started wavering in her self-esteem, but I waited six months because I just didn't know. Um, and I just can't stress enough, you know, you may have your village of parents and friends that help you get through every day, but knowing someone that is a little further in the journey from you and can walk the walk and talk the talk and just help you navigate the system, even if it's just emotionally, um, is invaluable. So I would encourage everyone to get a little involved in their PTAs, reach out to me whenever whenever you'd like, I'm always willing to talk to anyone about it because um, it empowers me. It makes me feel good. And for me, it's easy. And it's, and it's, and it's very, very gratifying um, to just be a sounding board and, and just be someone that can listen and give a little advice. And then I would also say like, you know, it is the kind of thing where, you know, even if your kid is doing much better, um, the, these, you know, 
issues that that my son grapples with, they stay, they, they are still there. So I don't want it to seem like um, there's some easy fix and all of a sudden magically everything gets erased. There's, um, you know, kids still need supports and help and um, executive functioning help and organizational skills, all these um, supports, they're really important. And as time goes on and, you know, onboarding things like middle school and high school can be really challenging. So I, I concur with, with Kate of getting a support group and then, but also really it can, you can sometimes need help navigating with schools just so that, um, you know, it doesn't feel as though like th th you can feel like you have a partner in it. And, um, I would just say that, it doesn't need to be contentious, but oftentimes navigating the space, even if you have a really good relationship with your school, it, it can be really hard um, yes. because you might know something and your teacher might not, or they might not have the resources to be able to do that or et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, having that support group to say, oh, well, wait a second, they did get this in this school. Let's really have a, a productive That's a really good point, Emily, because when she she went to a school where I knew no one, she knew no one, she was really going in cold. And it wasn't until after the first marking period that I realized she wasn't getting extra time on her assessments. And it's because the person that deals with IEPs was interpreting one thing in her IEP differently than everybody at her other school that had interpreted it. And I needed to march in there very nicely and say, no, no, she needs extra time, <laughs> you know, in everything, not just standardized tests. And that took care of it. And they're very responsive, but it's something you got to keep an eye on. And especially in middle school, because you don't have one teacher anymore. She has four different teachers and I've only met one of them. You know, it just um, it's a very different world. And I would love to to talk with the mother of the 10th grader Um to see what your high school journey was like, because as each year is going to get, it's cumulative, right? She's going to have more and more work and you reading and writing she's decoded, but it's now not going to get easier for her and her, you know, she's exhausted after writing something for an hour. And uh, I, I do wonder and worry about what that looks like in the years to come. So I'm going to find you. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you. Um, yeah. I also would like to give a plug for include NYC, because if anybody's having issues with their IEP or need help, they will really um, steer you in the right way. And they also have parent members who you can request to go to your IEP meeting for you. They're not all versed in, in the same um, needs, but they will help you with the process. And I am a parent member, so I will help anybody. <laughs> Do we have other any anyone else have questions? But feel free to um to unmute yourself and uh give a question or want to share. Uh, I see it's, uh, Alice is that a hand up. Uh, please, Gavin. Ahead. Thank you, Kate. I am so glad you said that. Um, you are just beginning the journey. Um, having a college age student. Let me just remind you, and Grace, since you're on the line, sweetheart, I hope that you will continue to speak up, tell us your truth share because there will be a time unfortunately that you will be 18 and if you need any of these accommodations when you're in college it's really up to you it isn't going to be your parents because of HIPAA compliance so I want you guys to really do think it goes so quickly having a college-age student it's a different world so I do want you to to, to help you guys think through the pacing at which you're advocating for these services. Um, if you go off to college in a different state, it will be different. If you stay within state, those accommodations can go with the child as well. But I want you to really, as the individual living with this, please be brave. Be brave with what you know of yourself. Be brave in understanding what your needs are. And try to find those who can um, help you get those words. 
so that you can share them with others. If it's a teacher, if it's a counselor, if it's a parent, you, your parent will not always be there for you. And so I do want to encourage this continued advocacy that you guys are doing for each other. And this is why I'm so proud of my D2 community. And even when I think McGuire keeping in contact with the uh, uh, the graduate who's sharing the resources that they gained from seventh grade, we as a community are still here. And so we appreciate that. Emily, I remember you coming on. I, I just want to say that, that, that please continue with this advocacy. Please continue to speak and to, and to tell your truth. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, you want to go ahead? Hi, everybody. Sorry, you don't have my camera on. I'm cooking. <laughs> um, you don't want to see my kitchen. It's really gross. Thank you so much for this, for the organizers, for organizing this, and for everybody's thoughtful input, Emily, for your time. And the student, oh my gosh, you are amazing. You're just a force. And your mom is kick ass. I love her. <laughs> Sorry, I'm spacing on your names right now. Um, but thank you for this. It was really, really helpful and informative. And although my my son doesn't have dyslexia, it's really interesting to hear more about it, especially in terms of IDA and ADA and what that looks like and what that might look like in terms of securing um, a disability status or securing any sort of interventions um, moving forward. And I do just want to piggyback on what the last speaker said that absolutely when you get to college, it's, it's a different, it's a different world. Um, I work at NYU and I see this a lot, how hard it is to secure accommodations. And there's a whole list of reasons why, I mean, they exist, but it is very much a self-identification process, right? So you're the student, you're the adult now, and you make those decisions and you decide which accommodations you need. And so I just think that you're going to be so much better off in doing this, this, this service, coming here and speaking about your journey and what that looks like and what you needed and what you got and where you're at. It's only going to help all of us spread the word. It's only going to help the students that are listening, the parents that are listening. Um, I'm just so grateful for you. And I think that your idea about student to student conversations within schools is a really, really awesome idea. And we definitely need to, to need to get on that and to do some organizing around that. Um, so thank you for that reminder. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kelly, you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, thanks. And I I'm going to have to um, head out, but I did just want to take a quick second and um, thank you all for organizing this and also to um, Kate and Grace um, for being on. This is like the best way to take what Emily shared um, and then, you know, really put it into you know practical um, uh, experiences. And, um, you know, Emily and I, I think, like first had this conversation about three and a half, maybe four years ago. And um, I will say as like a positive thing since that time, um, the amount of foundational literacy that is happening in our schools has um, skyrocketed. We have like two goals in this district all year that we set last spring and that we've carried forward this year. Uh, one is about middle school math and one is about foundational literacy. And we have been relentless uh, at going to schools and making sure that the work that they're doing in kindergarten through third grade is um, just what uh, Emily described, um, systematic uh, phonics-based program. We're very happy about this wit and wisdom choice that we've made because it's it's aligned to these decodable readers. So it should be like a really good on-ramp from um, a foundational literacy program to decodable readers to a core curriculum. So we feel like it's a really good choice for um, the district. And I, I remember I, not when, when I was a teacher, not in um, New York, but when I was a teacher in California, I remember the um, the assistant principal talking to me about how he felt as though our school was in the process of manufacturing kids with dyslexia and learning disabilities because we did not have, we had very, very poor instruction um, and a lot of teacher turnover. And we were, you know, creating in, in that school, there were like problems being created for kids um, that were really lasting a very long time. And um, 
I am thankful to the work that we're doing now. I feel like we are in the process of um, mitigating and trying to slow down, uh, you know, challenges that kids have in reading and, and feeling really good about how it is that we're going about it. And I will say, um, I am the parent of uh, two 10th graders. Um, and one of them, you know, when Emily was showing those, like the top is the, the green and the orange and the red. And I had one kid who was like, she, I think that like, she was like a reader when she was in kindergarten. And the other one, he um, was really not. And I remember him, we had him evaluated uh, when he was in first grade. Um, and they, he was kind of like right on the border, you know, here I am an educator too. And just, you know, to say to, you know, parents, it's like, it's a very tough place to be in. But, um, at the end of first grade, he was really not a reader. And, um, but I remember we went to his second grade teacher and she said, I know what to do with him. And she, um, pulled him aside and he engaged in um, Orton Gillingham phonics based instruction. We too hired a tutor who came to this the house um, a couple of days uh, a week for just you know like a half an hour at a shot. And um, he, you know, middle school was like deep in the middle of the pandemic, so that was hard for everybody. Hard to like just figure out like where you know things were going. But um, you know he started high school and he's. Um, He's really, really doing well. He now, he doesn't have an IEP anymore, but he has a 504 plan that gets him like the extra time that he needs. And so, um, but I just, uh, yeah, I just really uh, thank you again, uh, especially to um, Kate and Grace for for sharing and for Emily for always bringing like such such great knowledge here um, uh, to the community. But, um, and thanks Kevin. So we'll see you soon, I'm sure. <laughs> But uh, anybody, please always feel free to to reach out to us. This is uh, you know work that we have to always improve upon um, and want to stay close to the ground to families and kids. So thanks. Thank you, Kelly, for the feedback and for always being so receptive and being willing to listen. It's very rare. And thank you so much. And thank you, Gavin. This was great. I put my um, email in the chat. I'm happy to talk to anyone and and everyone um, that anyone hears you know, that, that could need some help or just a listening ear. So please don't be afraid to reach out. Thank you. Thank you to Kelly. Thank you to, to Grace and Kate and Emily. Um, really appreciate everyone coming and sharing their, their perspectives and, and listening. And I also thank you to, to everyone who joined. It was really um, good to, to, to hear from all of you and have your, your, your questions and, and your comments. Um, we're we're going to try to do this committee meeting fairly regularly and and kind of do some different different topics that are of interest to people. So um, you know, feel free to to reach out. I will also um, put my um, email address in the in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the email address. It's cc d two dot like d two dot net, right? Okay, um, and. Um, and struggling to do uh, to talk and type at the same time, um, but um, but yeah, um, we will try to do this this more often and hopefully have a kind of informal kind of supportive discussion where we can just you know talk about these things. Um, if there are, are any other questions, um, you know, feel feel free to 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 speak now. Um, but uh, but yeah, thank you all all for coming uh, so much, and um, I guess we can we can wrap up there. Um, but but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Thanks so much, Gavin, and everybody. Thank you. Oh my God, why am I screaming? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>